so welcome to um, today's uh, uh, webinar uh, for Monday. We uh, really thought about this right from the beginning. We wanted to get some information out to people quickly to help with any of the, the things that they might want to do. Um, but uh, we knew that this was going to be an important one for all of all of us who are serving individuals. Right? This is a really hard time. And um, so thinking about our own mental wellness during uh, the, the isolation. Uh, so that's what the focus of today is. For those who are joining me for the first time, my name is Dr. Aaron Brennan. I'm an assistant professor at Drexel's College of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry, where I lead a center uh, where we disseminate and continue to develop and continue to study recovery-oriented cognitive therapy, which is an extension of CBT for psychosis to individuals least likely to engage in treatment. Um, I have been really fortunate to partner with PEAK at the University of Pennsylvania um, under the uh, direction of Monica Kalkin and Christian Kohler. Uh, to We came up with this idea early on to develop a series of webinars to get out there uh, for information for people. So I appreciate that. All of that to be said, today we're going to charge in there uh, talking about mental wellness during the COVID-19 isolation. So the... Um, this this webinar uh, it's meant for information. Just as a, a you know, I I have no uh, financial benefit from these webinars. Uh, it is meant for information viewing. It doesn't constitute any type of formal treatment or intervention or or training from myself or Drexel University or uh, the Peak. So it's important that we all step back. And I think anybody who's been following these webinars, I've put this slide up here over and over again. And it's not because I forget that I give the slide, it's because I think this is the most important thing that we can keep reminding ourselves, is that we are in unprecedented times. And so uh, it's important for us to remember that. With this unprecedented time, there are high levels of uncertainty. This is going to impact the individuals that we serve, the, the loved ones that we have, but it's also going to impact us. It's really, you know, many of our jobs are uncertain. How are we going to do our jobs? When is this going to end? Uh, it could be, from what I've heard from the state of Pennsylvania, it could be two weeks or two months or tomorrow or never, I don't know. And the one thing I know for sure is that I don't know. And so there's a high level of uncertainty and that makes many of us anxious. It makes most of us anxious. Humans are not particularly designed to enjoy uncertainty. We are at a time when we have the largest amount of information available. The downside is we're at a time when we have the largest amount of information available. And so that can be really problematic. We don't know what different things mean. And so as we continue to take in more and more information, there's no real good way to, to understand that. Um, I have a, we have so much information coming in, but we have no way of really understanding exactly what it means. We're more connected than we've ever been um, in our lives. Uh, many of us probably are talking to people from years and years and years ago, from high school, from grade school, and, and, and even talking to people who we met at a conference once, and now we can see them forever. But we also feel more isolated than ever, right? We're, we're in these times where everybody is, is wrapped up in their own things. And so being mindful of, we have the potential for massive connection, but we also have that opportunity to sort of isolate and be, and be by ourselves. And there's no clear under, you know, no understanding or clear end in sight. We just don't know. And that's not a criticism of anybody. That's just the nature of what we're in right now. That can lead to high levels of suspiciousness. We can all feel really uncomfortable in these situations. And that's normal. So what we're talking about is anxiety. And anxiety never makes anything better. People think it makes us makes it better, but ultimately anxiety never makes the situation much better. So what we're gonna talk about is sort of a guide to mental wellness. The guide is gonna include connection. How do we stay connected during this time of physical distancing? Which is the WHO term for it is physical distance and not social distancing. So as mental health professionals, we should really start using that language of physical distancing versus the, the language of social distancing, because we can be very socially close. Um, activity, 
How do we keep on top of those activities for ourselves? We're really good at prescribing things. Are we going to be just as good at doing those things ourselves? How are we gonna set goals during this time? What are the things that we wanna accomplish? And then also, how are we going to manage the worry? Anybody who knows me really well, it's not surprising that the first three things that we look at are connection, activity, goals, and then worry comes after those, right? So the, we're gonna look at the problems later. Um, really paying attention to our self-esteem. Um, and then also, how do we work from home? That can be really difficult. Many people I've talked to have talked about, you know, uh, yay, I get to work from home. And then they go, oh my goodness, I need to parent from work. That's different. Um, so at the end of it, we're gonna think about how do we start scheduling our wellness? So connection, physical distancing is important. It is going to be crucial in the battle of what they keep referring to as flattening the curve. The more people who physically distance, the more we spend time away from each other, the better we're gonna to do to get on top of this, um, this problem that we've got. The problem with this is that humans are not designed to isolate, right? Um, and if we think about it, we are biologically prepared to develop severe fears or phobias toward a number of different things, right? We're, we're designed to fear dogs or spiders, right? We're designed to fear like heights. Uh, it's actually not the heights that people uh, develop a fear of, it's the sudden stop at the bottom that they're really afraid of. But interestingly, just as much physical, um, uh, social um, isolation, right? Um, uh, you know, being ostracized, social rejection. We are just as likely to develop a phobia towards social um, isolation as we are to any of these other fears. And so it really is sort of interesting. So we're at a spot where we're being asked to do something that keys into one of the basic phobias that we can have, right? And so um, these are really, really important things. Um, isolation can bring up many unintended problems that we don't really, um, uh, that we don't really uh, um, look toward, right? There's lots of less data coming in. Um, there's lots of less information coming in. And just as much of it, we can really start feeling alone. And that can really take a bad hit um, at our, um, you know, at our self-esteem. So how do we stay connected in this time when we're being told that we need to isolate? And that's why we're going to start referring to it as physical distancing. Because remember I said, we're at a time in our lives when we have all of these opportunities to connect. So here are some of them, video calls, right? Um, my little romper room routine in the beginning, you know, seeing all of these people. Uh, I sometimes feel like I am one of the luckiest people in the world because um, during these webinars, I get to see people. I get to see my friends from Georgia and I see my friends from uh, Danville and from Savannah, which is in Georgia as well. Um, but uh, I get to see new friends from California and um, I have all of these ways of connecting with lots and lots of people. Um, at the same time, lots of people are, are holding happy hours or having coffee. Um, you know, the other day uh, I had breakfast with my brother and my niece and my nephew. Um, you know, all of these types of things. I've gone out for walks with people. Uh, there are lots of different ways that we can do that. Video calls can be used to do bedtime stories. Uh, my, my kids have been loving doing bedtime stories with my niece and nephew. Uh, we actually did it, our neighbor who's just across the street, uh, the, you know, the wife is a, um, uh, a, a mandatory or, or, or essential personnel. And the husband's trying to do, um, uh, trying to do meetings. Well, they have a little four-year-old boy. So my kids got on and read him, read him stories. So the dad could have 30 minutes just to sort of have a break from, from trying to manage a four-year-old or two-year-old. I can't remember how old he is now. Um, my brother and I, he, he made a birdhouse and I fixed my kids' bikes, right? So there's all these ways that we can use video calls. We can cook together. The important thing, and you're going to hear this over and over again, that the, the key to wellness is scheduling, 
right? So my mother-in-law and our family, we have a schedule to, to have those times. Uh, many of my friends, they've all scheduled these happy hours together. There's lots of ways in which we want to schedule, schedule, schedule those things. But video calls give us a chance to connect really, really well. If we don't have video calls at our, at our fingertips, uh, there's the old-fashioned way of connecting. Texting, right? Um, sending texts to people. One of my dear, the people I love dearly, um, uh, He's a, he's a clinician in, um, in Philadelphia um, named Stephen Burkett. He just texted me uh, that he's, he's watching one of these videos and that just meant the world because I felt connected in that moment. Um, sending people funny memes. Some, one of my friends in, um, or colleagues in Utah sent me a meme about physical distancing after we talked about physical distancing while we were on um, a call together. Setting up games, right? There's uh, wonderful games that you can play through texting. Um, the one uh, I use a lot, it's called Game Pigeon, right? And so you can play darts with, with friends that you want. Uh, share pictures, things like that. So texting allows us an opportunity to stay connected. Um, absolutely, many of us on this call who are clinicians are going, is that really connecting? We're gonna have to figure that out when this is over. You know, that's gonna be a big question, but is it not connecting? I don't know, you know, and it's what we can do now. When I text, you know, one of my friends in Savannah, um, well, I'm staying 10 feet away from that person. Um, also thinking about online groups, right? So there are lots of social media platforms that have um, uh, groups that, that they have, that they've put together. Um, Facebook is an, ob is, is an obvious one. I'm not telling people you need to join Facebook during this time. Uh, but Facebook has active meetup groups. I think there are other venues that you can do active meetup groups where people get on the phone together. A friend of mine who I went to summer camp with, uh, every day at 1030 has a jam session um, for kids, doing kids music, 1030. Um, and so it's an active meetup group. Uh, I've seen um, uh, places of worship get together, um, whether it's Friday or Saturday or Sunday, and do uh, services over the internet. Um, and, and it's a way of actively meeting up and doing those types of things. Uh, there's also passive groups online. Um, one of the examples that, that I had was uh, I created, um, there was the thing going around on Facebook where they, where they kept saying, put your 10th picture on your camera roll on there. And so, and then you put it on and then they tell you what number you're supposed to do. So it kind of went back and forth and people just, it burnt up Facebook doing that. So um, one morning, I think this was a week ago or two weeks ago, I just posted, I said, hey, we're all keeping our morale up. Put a picture of your pet up, whether it's your fur baby or your scale tween or your feather teen or whatever, just put your picture up. And then I went and got my coffee. And I sat back down and I had 35 posts in the first hour and it was from two different time zones. By the end of the day, I had three or four different continents who had responded um, from across the world. And people were dying. People who never met each other were commenting on each other's pets. So we have this strong desire to connect. And so this, there's passive ways that we can do it. Is it perfect? No, but it's what we have at our hands. Then not forgetting that if you're living in a house with somebody, there are in-house connections, right? So figure out what are the times together that you can do, um, whether it's going out for a walk together, walking the dog, um, you know, whether it's watching a movie together, whether it's having dinner together, watching Jeopardy together, whatever those things are, those times together. Uh, we're convinced that our dog is about to go on strike uh, I think this morning she looked at me and said, can't you just walk yourself? Uh, because we've taken her on so many walks now. Just as crucially as it's important to come together and have time together, scheduling that time alone. How do you have a little bit of space? If you're all stuck in a house together, how do you have that space? Um, also thinking about how do we connect with um, maybe neighbors that we have while staying 12 feet apart? So last week was my birthday, and one of the things that we did, my neighbors all came over, and we measured it out, and people sat at different parts of the, on, on my driveway, and we were all 12 feet apart. 
Um, and everybody brought their own snacks and hors d'oeuvres and drinks and whatever. Um, and we sat there and we enjoyed that together. But it was a time together, um, just as equally, we're figuring out what are those times apart that we're going to schedule. So the name of the game that we're gonna talk about is connection. How do you schedule it in? Um, just as crucially, who are the people in your environment who are probably alone? So think about those people who might be disconnected. Maybe it's a neighbor who you don't really know that they have a lot of people around. Um, so in this time, it's important for us to you know, physically distance, but also reach out for the people who might need it the most. This is both true of the individuals that we serve as well as those people around us uh, because we all are connected when we're all connected. Activity. Busy hands or happy hands, right? Anybody who's been through uh, the, the CTR workshop knows this is sort of the core of it. When we're doing stuff, we feel better. The more you do, the better you feel. So the good news is this isolation provides us with extra time. The bad news is this isolation provides us with extra time. Many of us are accustomed to being highly scheduled. Um, think about some of us who go from, especially the people who might go from, um, whether it's you know your days, it's your helping individuals, it's answering those phone calls early, talking to your you know talking to your administration, all these things that we have to do, and then at night whether we're taking you know kids to activities, engaging in fellowship, going out and working out, going to the gym, all these things that we schedule in, um, you know many of us wish that we had some time on our hands, and some of us might be facing for the first time some time on our hands. Um, that we don't really know what to do with. Um, and that can be um, uh, really difficult for us to wrap our heads around. And so um, it's something to adjust to. Also, and this was a question that came, um, I gave this talk to um, a synagogue last Wednesday. And uh, one of the questions was, some of us might be facing feeling really over overscheduled. We might have more things on our plate. And how do we do that? How do we step away and schedule time? Because you're at home, so it can easily creep into entering emails from five in the morning till five in the morning, right? All the way, 24 hours a day, you're sort of on duty. So it's something to really think about. So the trick is uh, we know that people are going to be happiest, right? This is applying, um, you know, uh, our own concepts to ourselves. We know that people are happiest and content when we're engaged in three types of activities. Pleasurable activities, masterful activities, and social activities, right? And we're more likely to engage in these things, um, they're more likely to happen when we schedule them out, right? Pleasurable activities, those are things like games and hobbies and music, right? We have a lot of stuff on our to-do list. We're very worried and concerned about the individuals that we serve. And so thinking about kind of opening up a video game and playing a video game or uh, playing Uno with somebody or sitting down and reading a book that isn't about psychology, right? Or, or going out into the garage and sort of fiddling around on your, on your tool, you know, um, on your tool bench. All those things may seem like really frivolous. Like, why would I do those things? Um, and it's because we need to make sure that we're recharging our batteries with the fun stuff. Equally, um, how do we make sure that we're getting some of those masterful things done? The stuff that, that really makes us feel proud. Um, those are going to be things like chores, exercise, working. Um, it might be reaching out, might be finishing an article, reviewing an article, things like that. And then, of course, social. We are social creatures. And so it's important that we spend that time to, sort of, to come together um, and, and, and spend time with others. And like I said, scheduling these activities make them more likely to happen. So what are the goals that you want to set during this time, right? Um, on the weekends, we're not running around, uh, you know, maybe you go to the grocery store on, on the weekend, maybe get your laundry done, and that's probably about it, right? So we may not have as much, um, you know, we may have a lot more free time. So when the isolation's over and we all go out and see people again, you know, what projects do you want to say that you got done, right? Um, are there things that you've been wanting to do around the house? 
Um, is there some learning that you've been wanting to do? There are tons of apps that allow you to um, uh, learn languages. Um, you know, uh, my brother sent me a guitar thing. So if you had a guitar that's been collecting a ton of dust and you always wanted to learn how to play it, 10 minutes a day, you know, maybe you can play, you know, you'll be able to play uh, Old MacDonald by the time we're done. Uh, are there books that you've been wanting to read, movies you've been wanting to watch? You have plenty of time. You can finally watch The Irishman, which is like five hours and 75 minutes or something like that. Um, you know, there's, are there like series that you've been wanting to binge on, but you've always not really had the time to do it? You know, get those things done. Have you been wanting to return back to sort of spirituality or mindfulness or things like that? You've got time, you know, schedule those things back in. What will you have gotten done at the end of the isolation? Um, right at the beginning, before it was really kind of locked down, um, my wife said, let's fix the office, right? So the office went from this, right? And we've really accomplished it. So it looks more like this, right? So uh, people say that you can't really see the difference on the wall paint, but you know, you can get a lot of stuff done and it ultimately makes you feel more productive and makes you feel better about yourself as you're doing it. Um, now let's take a little bit of time to think about worry, right? Worry during the isolation. Um, I know I keep saying it, we're in times of uncertainty, right? And I think it's important for us to recognize none of us are superhuman. Uh, no matter how good you are at cognitive therapy or recovery oriented to cognitive therapy or any other type of therapy, you are not immune to working the way humans work. Um, and so we're gonna worry and that's okay. Um, it's a natural reaction. What worry is, is it's an attempt to prepare for a negative future. It's like problem solving, except we never get to the problem solving part of it. Um, and so I have a great magnet that says, um, Worries like a rocking chair, it gives you something to do, uh, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And so um, we're always, we're, there's lots of times where we're gonna spend time worrying and thinking about what if this happens and what if that happens and what if this happens and what if that happens. And it's probably not gonna be really productive to, to spend a lot of time worrying. Um, so the first thing to remember is, and I think it's helpful to remind yourself, there's a series of things that the professionals have been telling us to do. It's the same things. Right, so it's not new. It's not like if you like dig in, you know, if you dig on Google, there's gonna be like a secret trove of what you're supposed to do, right? It's physical distancing, stay six feet or ten feet away from people. Um, it's uh, wash your hands. It's cough into your arm. It's if you're sick, don't go out. Right? There's this list of I think it's like I always think in my head it's like six things you're supposed to do, the ones that everybody's telling you to do. You don't have to figure, try to figure out what is the one that I'm missing. You probably aren't missing one. They're pretty open about what you're supposed to be doing. So if you're doing those things, remind yourself, I'm doing what I'm probably, what I'm supposed to be doing. And that means I'm reducing the likelihood of getting ill. We're gonna have to practice acceptance. There's a good chance that um, with all of the people who are on this uh, call today, there's a chance that one of us or more than one of us might get, uh, might get sick. I'm not saying that we will, but just accepting that there's a chance that we might. All of these things are about reducing the likelihood of being ill. I'm also gonna share with you guys that over the weekend, I had a really horrible time when I went, I went to the grocery store. I love food shopping. Anybody who knows me on here knows I love food shopping because I pick out the food better than the rest of my family, so you know, um, and then they buy like such so few stuff that halfway through the week would be out. So it's just a better plan for me to go. But I'll tell you that while I was there, I was online and I had the worst um, anxiety reaction. Uh, and I became really overwhelmed and it was really difficult for me. Um, and I was okay with it. I said, this is, this is okay. This is what happens. I called my mommy. I talked to my mommy. She helped me feel better. You know, my family was really supportive when I came home and they gave me some time to do things. Um, and it's okay, but starting to practice acceptance that we, we may get ill. There's no way to 100% stop it. So if, you, if we feel like we can figure out what's the perfect way to stop it, we're wrong. And so all we're doing is just giving, making ourselves um, more distressed. There's a great line from the, um, from the movie, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. 
where Newt Scamander says, the way I see it, worrying means you suffer twice. And so the more we can practice acceptance and then start doing the things that we can do in our day, uh, the easier worry is going to be. Practice some mindfulness, right? Whatever your way of doing mindfulness is, uh, practice it. If you've never tried mindfulness, I'm not saying you have to do mindfulness. Uh, there are some wonderful apps out there, apps like Calm. Um, the app that I oftentimes suggest to people is uh, Headspace. The Headspace gives you 10 free sessions, 10 free um, sessions, and they come in a three minute, a five minute, and a 10 minute version. I have no financial relationship to Headspace. But um, what I always tell people is do the three minute version uh, because you can do, and, and by the way, I know I said this for the suspiciousness and paranoia um, and probably the families and telling them to do it. I'm telling all of us to do it. We can do anything for three minutes. And you, as providers, need to watch the videos too. It's not just for the individual. The videos are really, really helpful. But the three-minute version is really digestible. It allows us to practice it. And what mindfulness lets us do is it sort of lets us be friends with our worries and go, oh, hey, look, here you are. I recognize that that's what my brain wants to do right now. And, and we don't get into this like arm wrestling match with the worry of trying to make it go away. Uh, make sure that we're connecting with others, right? Um, if we're feeling worried, connect with other people. Other people are feeling worried too. So knowing that we're not alone in this situation because that's the key of it is that we really are not alone. Um, and then take some time. It's okay to sit with your worries. The more we try to play whack-a-mole and kind of get the worries to go away, uh, the more that they're going to keep coming back at us. So take some time, sit with our worries, and just sort of be with them. It's not the same as wallowing with them. The next important thing for us to really focus in on in this time is our self-esteem. Um, the the sense of incapability, many of us are individuals who have gone out to help the individuals that we uh, serve um, because it, there's a piece of it where we feel much more capable, right? And it's, it's a real crucial piece for us uh, to feel that sense of agency. Um, this is taking it away from us. Some of the people on this call had to move to telehealth without ever being able to demonstrated to their individual that they serve. Some of their individuals aren't, uh, some of our individuals aren't returning our phone calls. Some of them um, uh, might not be returning our phone calls, but the parents are calling us and saying, my loved one is, is getting ill. Um, it's a time where we feel really incapable and that could take a real hit on our self-esteem. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with us, but it still doesn't make us feel good. But the lower our self-esteem becomes, the more our negative thoughts can kind of flood in. Right? It's like we start putting on these glasses through which we see the world. Um, as we start feeling ourselves going, why am I going to do anything? Nothing's going to work out anyway. We might become a little bit less productive, which then reinforces the idea of, see, why do anything? It's not going to work out anyway. And we end up in this really bad sort of cycle of, of what we're doing. Isolation doesn't make us feel more productive and more capable. And so um, we need to do... We, if we take time to focus in on our successes. A lot of times on supervision calls or consultation calls, we, we make sure that we're talking about which of our kiddos is doing well, how are they doing? Thinking about the successes that our team or, or we as an individual practitioner have had. Also focusing in on the successes at home. How has, how has your family been really successful in transitioning to the, um, uh, to the isolation? Um, have you stayed in contact with family members? Um, also remembering that successful doesn't mean perfect, right? So I will tell you right now, my family and my house is not perfect, right? We do get frustrated. We're all stuck in the house together. Uh, but there's also these wonderful ways that we're seeing these successes um, and the things that, that, that our ability to rise. Uh, taking time to help others, not just professionally, but also thinking about it sort of personally. So if somebody's having a tough time, sending them a text message. Um, making sure that somebody is um, uh, connected or knows how to use Zoom, right? Taking a little time to help people because we help ourselves when we help others. And always remembering that we are all in it together. So this brings us to the, a really, really tough spot. 
It's the idea of working from home. If anybody, uh, if anybody thinks that working from home can be easy, I really, really suggest watching um, uh, Jimmy Fallon uh, on the, he did, he did a, um, a show with Jose Andres where he basically had to do five takes and he shows all of the takes as one of his daughters is climbing all over him. So I, one of the things I can say is, let's all take a deep breath. We're all working from home. If anybody's worked from home before and you were worried that somebody was gonna know that you're at home, um, you can, you know, unless, you're a, unless you are a, a person who has to work from the office, and so I see a bunch of people on there who are working from offices, um, I'll tell you right now, everybody knows that people are working from home. It's stressful, right? When all of a sudden you're in the middle of a meeting um, or in the middle of a call and then somebody walks in because they want crayons, that's stressful. You know, we, we go through our heads. What are people going to think? You know, what if my kid needs me, right? What if my dog starts barking? Um, I saw a great video uh, where somebody's cat started like just walking in front of the you know, in front of the, the camera. Um, what if your water heater breaks and you need to replace it in the middle of it and the guy has one time that he's going to come to do it? That happened. That's me. So all of these things can happen. And it's just a time to laugh. I know it's stressful. I know it's anxiety provoking. If you're trying to do therapy while you're doing this, if you're trying to do, uh, you know, if you're a provider and you're trying to have a meeting, Everybody knows. So the good news is most people are working from home and our individuals know that we're working from home. They also know that we don't sleep in a little cabinet at the office. So they know that we have a home and it might be a time where they're gonna sort of see a little bit of a difference. I can also say that I've had some pretty big barking and some loud um, jeopardy moments during some of my therapy sessions and none of the individuals I've served have heard it. So we might be hearing our family getting excited about Final Jeopardy, but the individuals who we're talking to might not. Uh, so, you know, um, if you aren't working from home, you're one of our heroes and you're out there doing really great work that's really important um, and taking care of us. And if you are, you're one of the heroes. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing, staying at home and socially distancing. So figuring out schedules, things like that, but, un, but also sort of giving yourself a break that working from home is working from home. So our last topic that we wanna just focus in on um, is, the, is the importance of scheduling our wellness, right? Not just for the individuals that we serve, but scheduling it for ourselves. Um, this isolation can start to feel almost like um, if anybody's ever gone away on vacation or had a really long weekend, um, and before you know it, sort of time has just slipped by and you have no idea what time it is. The isolation can feel like that. So making sure that you're keeping up on your sleep schedule. If you're a person whose sleep gets knocked off pretty easily, really think about what are the things you need to do to, to keep your sleep schedule going. Um, exercise schedule. If you're a person who exercises, making sure you're keeping up an exercise schedule. Also, by the way, if you're a person who spends all of your day driving and walking around, that's exercise. If you're now working from home and sitting at a desk, you've just lost maybe 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 steps. So figuring out what are you going to replace that with? Um, exercise gives us lots of um, endorphins, helps us feel better, um, helps us with some of our chronic pain. So it's important. Keep up your eating schedule, right? Um, many of us, you know, we work. And we have, you know, uh, work allows us to remember when we want to eat. So making sure that you're keeping up on your eating schedules um, and, and making sure that we're taking care of some of those things. Any of our other wellness practices, there are many things that we've learned to do over, over years um, to be well. Wellness will not happen accidentally. It is a purposeful endeavor. And so scheduling your wellness, um, just like... Um, uh, just like we schedule, if people take medicine, we schedule medicine. This is medicine and making sure that we're taking care of it in that way. We're all in this together. Notice that many people are experiencing sim similar experiences. We're all worried. Many of us are worried or lonely. We might be feeling isolated or suspicious, having sleep problems, and really starting to doubt our, doubt our self-esteem. So I know I say this all the time, 
Every one of you has a terrible disease that you caught from your mom on the day you were born. Uh, you're all humans, I think. Hopefully you're all humans, but you're all humans. And so we're gonna all be susceptible to these things, particularly when we're being asked to step up in, in, in a way in which we're not really certain. Um, so um, I know a couple of questions came in while I was um, talking away, but uh, so one of the questions I think I, so I think uh, it's a good question of how do we, um, uh, and everybody, everybody's been sending me lots and lots of messages um, about that. I touch my face a ton when I'm on this call. I do, I do notice that. Um, so <clears throat> my favorite time of the day is um, uh, after I've washed my hands for 20 seconds and then I get to wash, touch my face as much as I want. Um, so the, uh, I think there, uh, on some of the previous webinars, we talked about sort of ways that we can help people feel a little bit more at ease. Um, I think the important thing is, is finding out what are the things that we can do. Uh, I think the section where we talked about, listen, there are six things that we can do. Let's go through them. And really don't, we don't want to go over it a hundred times because that turns into sort of reassurance, you know, but go, here's the things. Let's write them down so you know what they are. What are the things that you're doing? And if they're feeling really anxious, say, have you graded yourself every day? So have you gone out only when you're supposed to? Have you stayed 10 feet from people? Have you done these things? What grade did you get today? Oh, well, I got an 80% today. What did you get today? So ways to sort of help people really keep track of that they're doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and so that, that's gonna be um, uh, an important thing. Uh, through telehealth, it's activity, activity, activity. Um, so uh, I think, whether it's, uh, and again, depending on how much access you have to your house when you're doing telehealth, um, if you can set it up, you know, um, whether it's, uh, I'm lucky because usually when I'm doing telehealth, uh, my family gives me the office, but I have lots of things, you know, lots of activities that I can do um, around my office um, at home just to, just to engage individuals in, uh, getting really good at um, using your telehealth. You know, can you swap, can you pull up a YouTube video? Can you share these things in that way? And then make sure that the individual is doing those things um, to, to, to uh, reduce their, their worry. Remember, worry is fueled by isolation because isolation gives you time to worry. So find out what are the things that they want to be doing uh, to, get, to move forward. Well, if there's nothing else, I wish you guys um, uh, a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Uh, make sure that you wash your hands. Um, do something uh, good for yourself. Uh, absolutely. Remember, uh, I know this seems like I'm sort of lecturing and I hope not, but uh, the seeds that we sow of our own mental wellness today, um, we're going to be harvesting next week and the week after. And so some of these things might seem uh, really um, uh, uh, frivolous or not important, but they really are important. And so take this time to figure out how do you schedule all of these things in. Uh, my wife this morning really asked me, how am I going to start sort of disconnecting from doing these things? Um, and so I'm making sure that I, I schedule those things in. So be well, be safe out there. Um, if uh, I can ever be of service, please let me know. And uh, I will see you guys hopefully Friday for groups and clubs through telehealth. Um, thanks again to The Peak for uh, partnering with me on this. And I will uh, talk to you guys soon. Be well.